Okay, uh, welcome to the W3C Community Group meeting for the 9th of September, 2020. Uh, topic for the call today is going to be further um, amendments to the data, site, uh, data set site specification standard. Um, I will begin sharing my screen. Um, I guess for context, this is the third call in a row we've had uh, dedicated to the data set site specification. Um, broadly speaking, there haven't been large points of, of principle at stake, but we've been hammering through uh, the technical details. Um, let me just get the presentation up here. Okay, are you seeing the presentation there? Uh, yep. Very good. I do. Um, okay, so, um, uh, Nick, um, essentially I just went through the issues list attached to the GitHub repository and started pulling out stuff that looked like it needed um, more work. Um, mm -hmm. the, there were some that seemed to me probably unproblematic um, in that we could probably just resolve them um as as discussed on the thread um so for differentiating feed types that is i believe the proposal was just to use um the kind value as the value of the um of the type which seemed i guess it, it seems eminently sensible as a solution um what is your sense of the practice of people who are publishing well, I mean, right now there, there's there's three places, in fact, that this information is stored. Mm -hmm. um, so there's the there's the type, sorry, there's the identifier, mm -hmm. there's the kind, and then there's also this um, alternative type. I think it's called. I'm just going to try and bring it up. Um, so well, actually, if you could bring up the issue, that would be helpful. Um, yeah. Yeah. Right. So uh, is there more on this issue? Is that, that's it? Okay. That's, that's about it. Yeah. Right, yeah. So yeah, so the challenge is that um, if you click on that meta.json link actually that's in there. Um, yeah, so at the moment there's this, um, in the feeds themselves, they're using kind of a combination of these things. Mm -hmm. Interestingly, in the harvester that, I don't know how they are, the harvester that um, for the, uh, states page works, but the harvester that's built into the, the test suite didn't actually need to do anything clever other than know whether that it's a parent or child mm -hmm. um, type, because everything else is actually embedded in the um, in the data. So what I thought we'd need to do is is have a kind of a switch on what's there the same as field, but I'm not sure we actually need to do that now. Um, but but then I mean it's probably still useful anyway for, for you know having some consistency to know what types are in there. So um, I think it's a nice politeness for the data consumer. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I think the challenge we've got is really this, as you can see in green on this uh, chart here, um, course instance sub event and headline event sub event um, and slot an individual slot. Kind of demonstrate that we've got because of the way the model's constructed we've got types that are being used in different contexts which mm -hmm. is slightly annoying um and we haven't really formally defined these anywhere um and so when you can you can get a feed of events but you can also get a feed in, in theory of course instance sub events and so within the dot net uh, implementation within the test suite um, we use these strings which are in this diagram to differentiate between those because obviously they need to be treated differently because they are kind of fundamentally different things even though they're modeled in exactly the same way mm. um, apologies for the siren so um uh i think it, it would be good to i think to formally define these i think if we could um it probably means that we need to to define them in the open active namespace so that would be i guess open active Okay. Um, but, but, but then the tricky thing there is that if we define them in the open active namespace, um, that, that, that some of these overlap with the types themselves. So facility use is obviously the same as the facility use type. Um, 
So whether we need an enumeration, which is like type of feed, um, which is kind of where you maybe have facility use feed, maybe we just prefix uh, everything with uh, feed or another, maybe feed's the wrong word actually, because it's not even feed, because this is, this is the type of the uh, object that's being, that's, that's exposed in that data. So it's, yeah. yeah. It's a really a gnarly thing, actually, from a modeling perspective, because you've kind of got this situation where like the, you've got this perfect model, but it's not quite enough information to, for things to stand alone when, mm. you're, when you're describing them. You know, if, you've just got, if you've just got a slot on its own, you don't know whether that slot is an individual slot or a, uh, a slot unless you look at the facility use to determine if it's an individual facility use or a facility use. Um, and the same goes for... Every, all of these there's basically and there's a, there's a nice little function in the test suite and in the dot net um sdk which um takes the um uh event and sub event and figures out which of these it is on the basis of what are, what are you and what's your parent and therefore what what is the the, the relevant string that identifies you mm -hmm. and converts forwards and backwards between those two things Okay, so so you said that's in the test suite. Yeah, so um, I can maybe I share share the other thing actually. Well, yeah, so the, the purpose behind that question was just we can we can rely upon publishers publishing this correctly because we've got testing. For oh yeah, right, 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 right. Yeah, sure. We can. Well, uh, we can test for that. If the test suite doesn't test for it. It infers it currently. Right. Okay. From each object, but but yeah, I mean, we could te we could we could test for it to confirm it works. Yeah. Um, but the, I mean, the, the yeah, so the uh, yeah, the issue is more this kind of modeling weirdness between the two, um, where you've got yeah, where, where that logic exists. So the two, the, the other one is the test interface. Um, so actually, you can I can show you this one if you go to the test interface. Um, yeah, that might be useful. So, uh, so that's so open, uh, openactive.io slash test hyphen interface. All oh, right, okay. So, um, so um, this is a really good example where um, if you scroll down to uh, the example, second example, there you go. That's, that's it. Uh, which has got some JSON in it. This is it, yeah. So you can see here that the way the test interface is built, in order to specify the type, you actually need to do, you have to specify two things, you have to specify the type and the super event type. And the organizer, in fact, in the super event. So that's the structure that, that's currently laid out there. So this, this test we call is basically saying, make me a new uh, scheduled session within a session series. And you can see there that that template is laid out as super event uh, is the type session series. And, uh, and so that, that knows then that that's a ses scheduled session within a session series. That could equally be an event within a headline event or an event within the course instance. Uh, mm -hmm. And that's the second level. The challenge we've got is that, that that's the full way of describing it within the current spec. And that's what why this is used in the test suite. But with the feeds you really just want and within the implementations you really just want a one liner that just just gives you right, that you just want to declare it yeah right you don't want to have to give it like this and that like this and the parent therefore that and that's why there's this logic at the moment in all these places which switch which converts between those two things um to detect this type almost um so so yeah i guess i guess um my suggestion would be that we would probably need to create a enumeration which has which where these don't clash mm -hmm. so that we can validate against it and clarify what yeah um that this is a an event series something um so i don't and i haven't really looked in the schema to see where this is done elsewhere because i imagine there's going to be situations in schema where for example um something can be a hotel but it can also be a type of hotel stuff like that so there's, there's bound to be someone someone's probably done it has this situation somewhere yeah um 
I think I think the enum suggestion is good, and I think obviously looking at schema.org for patterns is good. Um, I guess my my concern is how do we know that publishers are going to get this right? Um, given that the logic is actually a little bit complex, and I can imagine if we don't communicate that extremely clearly, um, it's going to get it, incorrect assertions are going to be made. Um, yeah. Unless, I mean, unless we do something whizzy whereby creating the data set site, there's some sort of dynamic querying of da 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 da, da but that just seems to be making uh, crazy mm -hmm. headaches. Um, well, this is, the, this is the real challenge, right? So, I mean, it's just to what extent do we need to describe what these feeds are in the data set site? Um, and so it's obviously, this is what I'm, I was saying with the, the implementation in the test suite, at least, it doesn't, all you need to describe is parent or child. You could actually do that with a Boolean. Is this a parent or a child? If it's a if it's a parent, I'm expecting to find children associated with it. If it's oh. a child, I'm expecting to find parents. Um, if it's neither, then that 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 doesn't matter. Um, which is the really the only relationship I think you need to process them because um, everything lives in sub event or in facility use in terms of the the parent child relationship. So you can just look for the ID that corresponds, and everything else is identical in terms of the data structure. Um, so, I mean, the other route we go down here is we just don't, we, we keep this enum as a kind of internal enum for tooling and for uh, SDKs and things like that, where that's declared separately. Um, and then we um, and don't formalize it. And then the data set site, we just say parent child um, rather than trying to. Um, right. And then I guess give guidance to potential data consumers about how you deal with that particular. Yeah. What, yeah. What you need to know for processing. Um, yeah, exactly. Not, so, yeah, I think the latter option seems to make more sense to me. Um, because I feel like the, the labor of getting that right is going to fall on either the publisher or the consumer. Um, yeah, it's just another thing to validate. I mean, it, yeah, I mean, that's the thing. It's, it's um, I guess the, the one of the things is that you won't be able to just look at a feed uh, and look at a data set site and know programmatically what type of stuff it has which is kind of annoying facilities or sessions things like that so i mean for that there's actually an alternative which is that we have and this is something that's already in the um in the metadata as well um but we could have an enumeration which is actually a slightly more abstract enumeration which is kind of facilities sessions courses events you know um and so we can meet the needs of the consumer trying to determine whether that's so so I, okay so a way of a way of saying that would be that you've got um you've you you could say this is a type of uh sessions um feed and it's it's a parent sessions feed and it's a child sessions feed and you'd know what that meant um and so we basically hmm. I mean, I guess, I guess the question is, if we can enforce it in validation, um, why not do it as tightly as possible? Like, like is splitting the difference really that satisfactory um, solution? What's that, sorry? Well, well I mean, so we've, we've, we've got sort of a choice between not specifying and having, well, sort of specifying at the level of parent-child um specifying at the level of quite specific you know every single individual type that's listed in that diagram and then there's a kind of in between split the difference of specifying the more abstract category but not all of the subclasses um yeah i mean the thing the thing is without specifying well i think we probably do need to have a level of specificity specificity um in there because we need to be able to, uh, like I said, pro programmatically know what types are in a in a feed. That seems like a reasonable thing to to ask, right? Like, how many data set sites support facilities? Like, we probably need to be able to support that that query. Um, so, I guess it's the question of whether, yeah, we we do that at the facility level, or whether we go down to um, the next level down. Um. I guess if it's, well, 
if we're assuming that validation ensures that publishers are doing this correctly, um, and we don't actually have a validator right now. Um, <laughs> yeah. Although I guess Jason, that's an interesting question. What kind of validator do we need for the data set site? Um, I feel like Jason schema would probably do the trick in this case. Um, well, so the, the validator we have already does uh, uh, to an extent do this because it has to for the test suite. Um, oh, okay, so, right. So if you go into the validator right now, you can look at the data set site in there and it will, it will validate it. Um, and all the validation for that, the validator just extracts the JSON-LD from the page and then validates JSON-LD. It obviously doesn't validate any of the other HTML markup. Right, okay, but then I guess to validate, it would actually, hmm, that wouldn't be sufficient for this kind of validation, right, where you have to validate the assertion against the contents of the feed. That would be an extra step of tooling. Right, but we have that problem anyway, right? So um, the, the thing that with the test suite um, potentially is that we can extend it. I mean, it's not in the current scope of work for the, the stuff that's going on now, but it could be extended to um, to check, for example, feeds against each other. In fact, so, sorry, that's something that it already does. It just doesn't um, have a test for it. Um, so uh, for example, to detect orphans, that's a thing that it does right now. So if you've got parent-child relationship, obviously there's a situation where the IDs don't match. Um, so you're kind of having to get more than just surface level validation. You're actually checking the integrity of those two things. So that's what you'd need to do for the data set site as well, is just check that integrity. Is the feed I'm accessing this is actually the same for URLs as well, is that you know the, a lot of the URLs in the feed probably need to be checked for integrity. So um, is the URL that, that something's referencing going to return a 404 or is it an actual um, real URL? Okay, I think as a practical matter though, I mean, I don't see a development timetable for that validator work anytime in the immediate future, right? I mean, I can see that being on the, on the to-do list, but, mm -hmm. um, I think I'm, I'm sort of tempted to say, should we put it in right now just as a parent-child level on the grounds that this is something that we've more or less got tooling that we can test against? Um, and put it on a, some kind of roadmap for, for tightening that validation in the future and tightening that kind of specificity in the future. Well, so a parent-child, but also with a, with a, I mean, are we still, I guess that's what I was thinking, probably need to allow the querying of facilities or sessions, right? So is it parent-child plus that? Um, and also bear in mind that we currently do do this validation anyway as part of every new data set site that gets published because they already include the identifier which has one of these strings in it. It's just it's not formalized. So I, I don't know if we I mean, maybe I'm, I guess I'm suggesting maybe we don't worry about validation so much as a concern in terms of the solution we choose because, uh, I mean, yeah, data set sites already have, a le well, the whole thing already has a level of manual validation anyway, but. Um, okay, so when you say validation, you mean manual checking, right? Well, so, I mean, this is my, this is my concern is that, um, my, my concern is entirely that publishers enter the wrong value into their declaration, and then you know, we're act actively misleading data consumers, basically. Um, yeah, but I guess, I guess my, yeah, what I'm thinking there is that that's, that's the issue we have with the whole thing, right? Like if they, if they put something wrong in their feed and we haven't checked it overall, <laughs> until we have a validation that covers it, then that, that, that there's misleading happening, whether it's the price in the wrong place, or there's all sorts of issues with some of these feeds that we've, we've kind of, had to manually come and kind of fix. So I guess this is, it's more like, is this, you know, to, it's more about supporting features. Um, but, but maybe this is, I mean, maybe it's a question for, because obviously we're just, this is the scope of this call. We probably can't, if it sounds like it's about requirements, maybe we should talk to the data consumers and find out, you know, I, I know we've got people on the call who usually attend that are those people. So maybe, maybe the thing is to decide whether, it's a requirement, in fact, to to figure out which feeds which um, from a kind of wanting to know that information when you're listing. Oh, feeds. okay. So the action there is just um, figure out what's needed. Okay. Uh, <laughs> yeah, pro probably. I mean, yeah, I suggest that. Probably... Yeah, it, it feels obvious that as a data consumer, what I want, you know, I want the most specific information possible, but I also want it to be reliable. And I guess that's the, <laughs> the two yeah. coordinates we're trying to measure against. Yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, and, that, and we can also take an action over to look at Schema and see what they've if they've solved it in a clever way. You never know; there might be an inspiration in there that yeah, they've really okay. practice um, because this must be a problem. Like we, there's a lot in that model that can get used in different contexts. Yeah, so it's it's almost like this isn't a unique issue. Sure. Um, Okay, so those two actions arising from that. Um, data catalog specification. Um, so this is really just um, a statement that we need to describe data catalogs, um, mm -hmm. which is sort of agreed, really. Um, I, I think so. I mean, this one is actually lifted straight from schema. There's not much we're, we're doing in there other than using the has part, but that's also in the Google documentation in, a, in, a, in the roughly the same context, so. Um, Okay, so I think there's nothing to do there except really to close the issue and acknowledge that it yeah, needs to be documented. Mm -hmm. um, so pagination, so this is about um, providing the total number of items in a, in a feed. Which we discussed uh, previously, right? That's, yeah. um, I and guess, actually, that's an interesting, because with the test tweet, I, I, think, I think I agree with you actually, um, looking at that, because I know that came out of your kind of harvesting experience somewhat, and I can't, did, in a test suite, we did the same thing. It was a massive feed of some provider, I can't remember. And it was, I was looking at this thing thinking, yeah, percentage bar would be useful right now. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it would be really great to know how many items there were. Uh, so I completely, yeah, completely agree that would be a great feature. And super easy to add to the test suite and other places where that would be useful to know. Okay, so yeah, the only, I guess there's a tr kind of trivial nomenclature question about what is that properly called, a uh, property called, um, yeah, um, total items or something. Um, yeah, we probably should, I think there's something stuff in schema that does this already um, in maybe for lists or something. And there's also Hydra. Hydra has a total items uh, type thing as well. So maybe between Hydra and schema, we can be inspired of, of that one. Sure, okay. And then I guess the, I guess what needs to happen is a count query of some kind from the, so, so that's a, that, has, that, that does add a sort of slightly more dynamic aspect to what the data set site libraries do. Um, yeah, so I mean, the good thing is that the data set site libraries currently are, de are designed for dynamic rendering. So it's, it's designed for the idea that you might, for example, have different brands if your if you're legend and GLL is one of your customers and you might want to produce a site per brand. Um, and that's why it doesn't do, it doesn't just statically produce HTML that you then copy and paste into your site. It's a little bit more there. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, that would be really easy for anyone to do. And also the caching recommendations around it as well. Um, cache it for 15 minutes or whatever. Um, that would all work. So I, yeah. And obviously we, I think we talked about this last time. We don't need that number to be a hundred percent accurate because it will change as paging continues. So as long as you've got a rough number, you can yeah, it's, it's, for, it's for a progress bar kind of yeah um, yeah 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 um, okay so yeah I, I can see i guess the coding there has to be a bit more defensive than um it would be for some of the other variables that are dealt with in dynamic page generation but nothing mm -hmm. nothing too uh involved um, well i guess there's a good question about whether we're going to make that required or optional for the data set site spec which is interesting I mean, it's going to be a lot of work for people to update to, to, well, not a lot, but there might be situations where that's more work, but then it might be, it depends on how valuable we think that percentage bar is, I suppose. Um, yeah, let's raise that as an issue on pagination. Um, again, that might be a question for uh, more than just us to, to chip into there. Agreed. Uh, Um, okay, spoof proofing identifiers. So this was about defining a um, URL pattern for identifiers um, that would constrain options, basically. Um, yeah, which I think we've kind of got some agreement on that issue. I think so. Yeah, I think we can probably close this one. I think it was just you proposed a pattern. I said it should be an array of patterns, and you said, "Yeah." I think it's roughly the conversation there. Yeah, my, my understanding is these issues aren't closed only because they don't exist in the spec yet and they haven't kind of been verified as the spec does what these issues do or something. So maybe it's just a case of making sure we put this in the spec and then yeah. check. I just, I just wanted to raise it here to make sure there weren't any sort of nuances I was, was missing there. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so those were the ones, uh, those are those that classified as potentially resolved. Um, we've, we're now half an hour through, but. Um, Great. Okay, so <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> Although, um, it, for, to be fair, the first one was very ill-defined. I mean, that was just a very like, here's a diagram with a problem. Right, no yeah. Solutions, so, yeah. Um, okay, so handling of base URI. Um, I wasn't clear on whether this one is to some extent superseded by all of the discussions that have been happening. Um, oh, yeah, what's that issue? Um, I'm trying to remember which one this is now. Uh, um, we need to support absolute orders feed URLs. Um, right. It wasn't clear to me that this was really well, so okay, ah, so right. That's because the, there's currently an inconsistency in this in the open booking spec. There's currently the, and this is this is primarily primarily for caching reasons, um, depending on you've how you've configured your CDN. Um, so the, the idea here is that the orders feed may be at a different URL to the rest of the booking uh, endpoints. So the booking endpoints will all have the same base URL. That was a discussion happening in Schema. Seems everyone's aligned on that, um, and. I think originally the version 0.3 of the of the booking spec had like a very hypermedia vibe to it, so you could just find URLs and use them from the yeah, and it was it was kind of every response would give you a URL that you'd go to for the next response. But I think we kind of realised that most things now don't really work like that. I think apart from if you're going full Hydra, um, it's generally the case that you can get a Swagger spec that all the endpoints are where they are and that's very well defined and they don't move around depending on what you click on. And when you when you build your your implementation, you're not thinking, I'm just gonna grab a URL from here and just post to it a bunch of personal data, right? Because that's just the, all kinds of madness. So you kind of wanna know consistently where you're posting stuff and that doesn't come dynamically out of the, um, out of the re responses. So um, so that that's why that, that moved away from hive media towards a base URL. I think that, that seems like it fits very well with all of the, um, the schema stuff that's going on. Um, however, there's this one remaining question, which is that, well, there's a, um, a feed, which all the other feeds can be anywhere, right? There's no, we haven't got any constraints about the open data feeds. They can live wherever you want. And that's for caching reasons again, because you might want to put them somewhere where, um, like Gladstone, for example, has uh, a special um, cache, ed edge cache CDN, which specifically handles RPDE. Um, and exists in a completely different domain to all of its implementations, all of the um, local installations that exist. And so um, the data set sites on the local installation, but then the actual fees themselves are in a, in a completely separate setup and that works really well and there's no need to constrain that stuff. Um, and so I suppose in a similar way, I mean, let's take that example, maybe Gladstone would want to use that same edge cache for the orders feed um, there's some nuances around the authentication there which make that a little bit more tricky. Um, but if they did want to do that, then currently the spec might, well, the inconsistency might constrain them because we have no way in the data set site spec to specify where that orders feed lives at the moment. Um, and in the booking spec, it just says the orders feed can live somewhere else if it's defined in the data set spec, uh, the data set site. So it's all, it's it's purposely deferred it to the data set site to a feature that doesn't exist, right? Because we haven't we haven't put it in yet. So um, so is it is a question of um, whether we want to um, have yeah how we want to kind of handle that. I mean, do we want to actually try to um, get a get that feature in? I guess. What this sits in tension with is the discussion about endpoint URL with the idea that that you know, you've got endpoint URL which just points at the at the initial endpoint for the interaction and then you've got a documentation URL which points to some kind of swagger or what endpoint description or whatever the, um, the yeah. property is. Um, and so I suppose in that scheme of things, supposing that everybody had an open API slash swagger um, documentation available, that orders feed URL would presumably properly sit in there. Exactly. Um, That's right. So I guess it's about how much we, do we want to mandate that entire chain or do we want to short circuit that a bit and say, here's a new property for the orders feed um, and just stick that in there. Is that tally with your understanding? Yeah, that's exactly right. Okay. That's exactly right. And if we put that in, that property would then override whatever Swagger would say about where that, that endpoint was supposed to live. It's kind of annoying from Swagger point of view, although I think you might be able to do something in the Swagger doc to um, 
add a new base URL or something, which you can. Recommend. Yeah, they've got a. I actually, I actually looked at it, and it, it's it's quite simple. Which is, you know, if given a if if given base URI, um, but a path declared underneath that is not relative, it's interpreted absolutely. So that's you know. Oh, well. you know the right. um, so they could just customize the swagger. Uh, yeah. yeah. So okay. yeah, I mean, I guess it's it's funny, isn't it? It's almost there's a bit of me that's like, well, there's no point constraining this. I mean. We're just literally doing it for some for modeling reasons. Oh, we can't if we can't if we don't define a property. It's just well, why, why don't we just keep it simple? Um, so I guess why? Yeah. So maybe there's no reason not to. Um, yeah, I think. Um, I mean, I guess I guess the risk is if we've got the risk. I guess is a divergence between your other API documentation, which we've kind of implicitly recommended elsewhere, and an explicit declaration in the data set site. I guess that's a question of. You're sort of maintaining two different declarations about where the order speed lives. Yeah, that is true. Well, I suppose the other way of looking at it is that, like, this is this is a completely speculative feature. We have absolutely no idea if it's going to be something that people are going to want or not. Um, so maybe we, you know, we wait and see how the implementations go, or you know, because we could. Hmm. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's, I'm just I'm really thinking, you know, after. Gladstone and Legend will probably have more of an idea, but because the trouble with this one is that it is, there is a um, uh, there is authentication over the top of it, so mm, it's right. not super easy to edge cache um, unless you take the API keys into account, which most caches don't, most um, CDNs don't do that. So you're probably going to have to have some internal caching mechanism anyway, um, and if you're going to do that, then you know, it's, it seems, yeah. So, I mean, it, it might be a thing that ne is never needed. And then what we've done is add complexity to the specs speculatively because we've just, you know, thought it might be a helpful feature, but actually, and then every implementation needs to handle both options and whatever and deal with it. So I guess the other option is that we make a beta property um, that is like whatever this, you know, put this somewhere as a bit like we've done with the barcode stuff in the booking spec itself. We've kind of acknowledged that we've, we've put, we've built the spec with a known limitation and said, we don't know enough about barcodes at this stage to know how this is going to be used. So we're going to purposely introduce a beta, beta property that will have to be used with the booking spec in order for this to work. Um, but we want to learn through implementation experience. And actually that's a very minor part of the spec. So, I mean, yeah, one way we could do it is just put a beta property in for now and then, in the future, if it becomes obvious that this is something that people want to do, um, we can then, you know, we can adapt the tooling to read that beta property and, um, uh, yeah, and and test for it and things like that. Okay, sounds good. Um, I think I think beta property makes sense there. Yeah, um, without buttering things too much. Um, okay, I'll add that as an action. Um, uh, publisher, creator, maintainer. Um, this one was kind of you talking to yourself. <laughs> um, yeah. I went on a whole journey with this one. Yeah. Um, and I think the sort of conclusion you arrived at, and I believe I plus one it there, um, which was just to keep booking surface, basically. Yeah, um, I think so. I think I was, I was reading too much into can we make this fit within schema stuff but it's it really doesn't um very clearly yeah it's quite a bespoke kind of um requirement isn't it yeah and it's really ha i mean it's going to just complicate it for everyone that we in the e open active ecosystem that wants to use this property for something definitive it's going to just make it a lot more messy so okay let's maybe just retain the original um or well the current implementation i suppose current approach yeah uh, okay yeah, yeah. retain um, okay, feature assertion. Okay, this one's a bit more um, meaty, I think. Um, so this is about indicating. Oh, hold on, bad link there. Um, this is about indicating. Um, oh, that's so annoying. Um, which features a particular data set of, or feed assemblage, I suppose, implements. Mm -hmm. um, now, how did you? Is it the conformance certificates this lived in? 
Well, I think conformance certificates is related, right? Mm -hmm. That's that's kind of one approach. Would be uh, yeah. yeah. So the first approach is your option one is profiles defined via certification, mm -hmm. um, and then the second one is more just a kind of con use conforms to and then an enum basically to describe what is available. Uh, mm -hmm. I kind of wonder if the answer is not kind of both, really. Um, that given the conformance certification isn't a reality yet, and it won't be for a while, um, we have an enum, but we also have an option of URL pointing to further description. Well, this is an interesting one, right? Because the the conforms to it. Well, I mean, now it's been defined in schema a little bit more closely. Um, to to um, DCAT, which is I guess where they're getting the inspiration from now. Um, it does look like, yeah, it does look like the, the it's almost it's a, it's a there's maybe a level of indirection implied. So you probably want to say conforms to modeling um, open booking spec one, and then some other property which the in fact it's conforming to that would mean that you've got that property. You see what I mean? Um, uh, sorry, no. I, I, what? <laughs> um. So, so the the feature spec is actually part of. So, so um, conforms to itself, right? Doesn't give you anything about enums. It's just uh, this is the spec it conforms to. Right. So the, the semantics of conforms to. This is kind of overloading it with some stuff that it really doesn't do. Um, right. Okay. okay. So what you're really saying is that. This web API conforms to Open Booking API uh, there, and that the Open Booking API has a feature um, enumeration facility within it, which that spec defines or links yeah. to another spec that defines. So you're, it's probably that I think that's probably the more semantically correct way of of looking at it because then you're well, you're you've got a really well defined feature profile thing in the booking spec. Which is what this is saying we're conforming to, um, because yeah, because conforms to doesn't do any of that. Like, what does it mean, for example, to have these hashes after that? Like, um, does it mean full conformance with each one? Does it mean like I don't know? Like, um, there's, I mean, yeah, we'd have to make it up. Yeah, or add some documentation. Yeah, um, have to, we'd have to make a separate URLs for. Yeah, and the other thing is that if you're looking at if you're uh, Google crawling this conforms to is going to be recognized. And obviously they are expecting like one or two standards that they can link to and you know okay. reference. So um, okay, I think I feel like that leaves us with a conundrum, unfortunately. Like I, I take your point. Um, but the difficulty is, I mean, when are we getting conformance certificates? So definitely a good idea. Um, but you know, they're quite speculative at the moment. Well, um, so the conformance certificates are already generated by the, the test suite, that that, that, that works. Um, whether we want to allow, I mean, they're, they're self, -certificates, self certifications at the moment. So they're not, um, there's not a paid for option all the rest of it. There's other questions about whether we offer those in the future or what that looks like. But but yeah, I mean, right now we do have the, the future of conformance certifications that we can, we can use. Um, well, I suppose maybe the qu the question before that is um, to what extent. Well, I guess if a conformance certification is an assertion of specific conformance within a spec, mm -hmm. right, as a concept, then actually, you know, that assertion could be anything, right? It could just be JSON. It doesn't like. I, sorry, what I mean by that is, um, conformance certificates is like a big thing that could be lots of things, mm -hmm. but for what we need it to be, it's literally just an assertion that these features, uh, that this thing conforms to these features. Whether that's actually related to a conformance certification at all, whether it's literally just a conforms assertion. Yeah, okay, yeah. Yeah, I guess I was assuming implicitly that it meant sort of third party confirms assertion. Um, but. Right, but it could literally be, uh, you know, first party. I mean, it could just be, I, I've confer I, I assert these things. Mm -hmm. um, and the conformance certification, I mean, if, yeah, and then how that, that uh, JSON gets generated is then a question. Maybe there's a 
some kind of digital signing of it that allows it to be, you know, that then, then almost the conformance certificate becomes the digital signing of the assertion, that the assertion itself is the, like we can build, like that's, that's something we could spec and then easily include in anywhere. And it's basically just an enum that's well yeah. defined. Yeah. It's, um, okay, so what we need, what we need is a property name for that. Um, yeah. Um, the enum is to be defined. Um, and then I guess some thought about what a third party um, confirmation of that would look like. Well, so this might be a good um, segue into um, if you just go, if you jump to the conformance certification one, there's some JSON in there um, that does uh, do a little bit of that. Um, it might be, I don't know, you might have to go, oh yeah, perfect. Um, yeah, so maybe, uh, yeah, if you just scroll down to the JSON in that blob, right. So, uh, so it's a good question. Right. So this is interesting. So I think the way that we're talking about this, actually, the type conformance certificate might be not quite what we're saying here. Mm -hmm. It's more like feature assertion or something. Um, yeah. And so therefore, the conformance certificate is actually just certifying the feature assertion, if you like, which may be a sub property of mm -hmm. that. Um, so you, and then it's about this feature implemented. And maybe we have, I mean, at the moment, I've just used SCOS because we've used SCOS everywhere in this example, but um, you can imagine that we, we define a, like a standard control vocabulary like we've done elsewhere that can be evolved and uh, contain whatever it needs to contain. Um, and that that would, I mean, this just, yeah, this, so at the moment, feature implemented uses SCOS, and then there's also like an opportunity type implemented, mm -hmm. which is, which, which actually, that's interesting. So opportunity type implemented is kind of what we were talking about earlier with the problem of um, feeds, right? Mm -hmm. um, actually, if you scroll down, I can't remember what we've done there. What is what does it say? Oh yeah, okay. So it's just using strings. <laughs> it's not very useful. <laughs> but yeah, so that's that's kind of referencing the earlier conversation about that whole problem and like serving kind of a similar need here. Um, and then. Um, and then the associated media in this example, so the way the test suite generates conformance certificates is that is the uh, digital signature, is the associated media. Okay. Mm -hmm. So that's the thing that basically means that um, everything else is valid. Um, so I, yeah, you could almost, you could almost move uh, associated media awarded to and recognized by into conformance certificate thing, and then it could be referenced there could be an assertion there that's uh, references or vice versa, something like that. Okay. Um, there's 10 minutes left on the call. Um, or sorry, eight minutes left on the call. Um, I think there's kind of a nest of semantic or not, not, not semantic, uh, just naming issues there, I guess. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, and do we want to use scores for the enum or use or use um the model enums that we have in other places like gender we could use that and this controlled vocabulary versus i mean yeah yeah um but okay so let's let's continue the discussion on on that just on github i think and i'll update github with with various points raised um very annoying. How can I move my Zoom bar? There we go. Um, <laughs> can't get to tabs because of Zoom bar. Um, that was everything that I had done that needed resolution. Um, did, we, did we cover the status codes point at the end? Oh, I'm sorry. Good point. Status codes, right. Sorry. So this is what do we do with um, feeds that have been removed or unpublished? Um, I kind of thought so. I kind of wondered how much this was something to do with the spec per se and how much it was like um, return a 410 code, you know, return the, return the appropriate HTTP status code if you've unpublished something. Um, and then we just issue guidance for how you, how you deal with that from a GDPR perspective, et cetera. 
Um, yeah, I guess I guess pro probably we need. Well, I, I imagine if the data set site specification is defining the data set site endpoint, it probably just needs a little status code section in there, right? That says this endpoint should return a two hundred unless mm -hmm. X. In which case, yeah, like four ten, great. I mean, if that's the that's the appropriate one, yeah, gone makes makes more sense than found not found. Um, I guess yeah, like not found is currently implemented in, in in obviously one place, but that's not a reason to use it necessarily. Um, and I guess a, a good that's a good example where having it in the spec is going to be really helpful because then we can point to that and say right, we need to move that to a four ten instead of a four oh four now because that's what the spec expects and that's what data consumers will react to. Yeah. Um, do we want but do we want an explicit flag in the in the spec as well um, just to make the semantics extremely clear or because well, it is resource removed, which is what we're trying to communicate. Um, yeah, that's true. But I guess there's, I, I, it's interesting because with the HTTP um, status codes, they tend to mean different things in different contexts mm -hmm. and often they're overloaded. Um, so it might be worth, uh, and also for an implementation perspective and a testing perspective, making it really clear what the expectation of those semantics are um, so that you know when you've conformed. I mean, let's say that we, you know, we got a, the test suite to, you know, do the whole a data set site thoroughly in, in the future as a as a kind of test set of tests i mean how do we know that this is conforming ideally you have a test interface thing that says turn off your data set site and you turn it off and then you test to see if it's returning a 410 and then you turn it on again um and then that's your that's your future um to test which i guess it's hard to kind of code and uh, uh make explicit in there if we don't have the associated sure okay so again there's maybe a nomenclature question of yeah what, what is that property and what are its possible values um oh sorry I, uh maybe we're talking about different things uh i was just saying make the status codes explicit in the spec oh, okay right 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 rather than um communicate them declaratively in the code right. yeah right well i mean exactly in this case it's just the thing the thing is the, the, the what this might have the 404 might persist because they've literally taken the software out of their system. Um, so it might just be, I mean, mandating co mandating JSON to describe that might be almost more burdensome than just saying, you know, just um, you configure your IIS server to return the status code for this, this endpoint ongoing. And then you can, you can rip out whatever software you had in there and just make sure you're still returning that status code. Um, which is why I actually wonder whether we need to say maybe 410 or 404 to be um, kind of uh, to allow whatever um, infrastructure or frameworks that are being used kind of full flexibility. Um, I guess the hmm, I guess the tricky bit is 404 implies to my mind maybe something's broken and you you might <laughs> this might be populated again. The problem is just on our end, whereas 410 is this has been deliberately removed, wipe your data. Um, yeah, that's interesting. Well, I suppose it's, yeah, yeah. What do you do if you get a 404 and you've got, mm, yeah, I see what you're saying. 410 seems a bit more like, a, as a, it'd be like reacting to a 500, you're thinking like, you don't wanna do anything to that. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Let, well, okay. Let's continue that discussion then on the on the thread. I mean, I think we're close to resolution, but we've got uh, we've got three minutes here. Um, so I'll just say um, AOB with three minutes on the call. Yeah, I think from my perspective, that's uh, that's good. Uh, obviously, the um, uh, the spec itself, I haven't had a chance to look at yet. Um, in terms well, of once, I, once I fix the respec issue, you can <laughs> read it in a friendlier way. Sure, no worries. Um, and I guess the other uh, point on that was uh, obviously the last call. I think we talked about a deadline to the community, or at least moving this all forward. So I haven't seen that. Um, maybe that's being pushed back because of the schema.org stuff, which now is in some state. Yeah, we need to think about that because I ending last call, I assumed it had missed release 10, but would be in release 11. And now I feel like that's still possible, but it's not assured. Um, well, really, yeah, release 11 doesn't seem to have been announced yet last time I checked, so. 
Uh, well, yeah, and also assuming that they're sort of publishing more or less according to the schedule they, they believed they were going to. Wow. Um, I feel like it might be pushed back a little bit by just by the fact that actually this issues list is fairly comprehensive. Um, you know, there's a fair few issues to work through. So maybe second October was a bit ambitious, but I wouldn't want to leave it too long. Because mm. this, I feel like this should be a simple specification. Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, I guess like, well, maybe we just need to, um, we still haven't got the spec in, we've got a few issues, we haven't integrated stuff. So maybe it's a, is it a case of just, doing the work we need to do to get the spec into a place where it does everything and then maybe yeah. next call the call after assessing whether yeah okay that makes sense yeah um, need to have a clear well basically clear i mean whenever you want for, for me personally to review i'm happy to whenever that makes sense sure yeah well like, as i said i'll fix the respec issues um update the, update the github issues and yeah so, so it sounds like next steps uh are we gonna are those github issues gonna be incorporated into the spec for then review or do you want review first and then the new features added um i think some of the issues are more or less resolved in which case i'll put them in the spec um and then the ones that need discussion will be discussed yeah uh, but I'll, I'll ping you when i've got the spec readable and available online cool okay right. okay talk to you later nick all right thanks Thank jen okay. bye see you guys